How much money can you really make selling chips and soda? We gross more than $50,000 a month here at Hill Vending. That is a ton of snacks. And today I'm talking to founder Adam Hill to hear how he started Hill Vending with absolutely no experience. You can definitely do this from home. I know people who do this out of their SUV. Well, there's four keys to vending. You have to nail all four of those in order to be successful. I don't think there's anyone in the country that's doing the level of sales we're doing out of one box truck in a vending business. I don't want to drop this thing. Yeah, it's going to be an expensive bill. Uplip and Adam partnered up to develop a complete blueprint that you can use to start your own seven-figure vending machine business. Guys, welcome to a new episode where we are covering a guest that's been previously featured in our podcast. We'll make sure we share that link with you later on in the video, but for now, we're meeting his business, a vending machine business that skyrocketed rapidly. And today, Adam is gonna share all his secrets to success. So let's go meet him. Adam, it's good to meet you. Good to meet you. Let's get into this. I'm so excited to get to know the industry, the business and so on. But awesome. for those that haven't heard you on our podcast, right. uh, tell us a little bit about your story and how you got into the vending machine business. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for being here. I've our been pleasure. in the business uh, about eight years now. I was in the corporate nine to five. I wanted something with more freedom and uh, flexibility. So hopped in, bought a vending route uh, with no experience, made some mistakes along the way, which machines are good, which which machines are bad, and here I am now, able to turn it around and get profitable locations. But out of all the industries and all the businesses you could have switched to from corporate, why right. the vending machine? Who gave you the idea? Where would the inspiration come from? Yeah, it's just the vendor that was doing the vending at my work, at my job. Gotcha, okay. We started talking to him and he wanted to get out of the business, so kind of one thing led to another and kind of got into it. Well, we're standing here in front of your shop, right? right. This is where the operation uh, begins. Yep. Why don't we take a quick peek inside and yeah, show our audience awesome. kind of what everything looks like. Come on in. So you've got a warehouse. How many square feet here? About 1,600 square feet. What do you pay for it? Roughly 1,600 bucks a month. Not bad. Yeah. But for somebody watching us right now, Adam, inspired, wants to get into this business, doesn't have a shop, right. has a home. What can you tell them in terms of starting this business from home? Is that possible? Yeah. Well, I mean, when I started, I didn't have this. You know, I had uh, where I'd find deal on Coke or Pepsi, and I'd store it in my living room. I lived with my brother no at the time. Yeah, I didn't have a wife and family, but you can definitely do this from home. I know people who do this out of their SUV, so you don't need a huge operation. We have around 100 machines now, but you can start with two, four, and build it to what you want. At which point do you think, you know, I need a shop? You know, something like this, you can start with a small storage unit, mm -hmm. you know? You don't want to store a lot of the oddball characters. You want to store the stuff that you're going to go through a lot, uh, and you don't I have to it. constantly be going to the store for, so. But yeah, two-car garage, you know, you could fit a couple machines in there, some product. Mm -hmm. A good base to get started. Awesome. Okay. What were your profits over the last couple months, and what kind of profit margins do you shoot for? Yeah, so your markup, I mean, on a, on a can of Coke, you at least need a 100% markup. You know, chips and snacks, everything's a little bit different. I mean, at the end of the day, I say the 50-30-20 rule, which is 50% of your uh, income goes to product, 30% would be what your take home or payout for employees or yourself, mm -hmm. and then 20% would be miscellaneous for your credit card fees, gas, insurance, all the rest. You started the route by yourself, solo. At right. which point did you decide that, hey, I need help, I need to delegate this task to X, Y, and Z, and Y? Let's talk about that team structure and how you built it today. Right, so when you're a solo kind of operator, right, you can never, you have to be there all mm -hmm. the time, right? So it's kind of like you're handcuffed yep. to the business as well. So after doing it for a couple of years, my brother was interested in getting involved and in growing the business. Then a couple of years later, my brother-in-law joined. So it just kind of, as the route grew and as the number of locations grew, you need more help and more people to to fill it, because there's only so much you can do in one day. But are they doing the same tasks as you're doing so, ultimately, or did you say, look, you focus on that, you focus on that, and I'll yeah, do so this our general, that. our our basic setup right now is we have our our box truck, and that services Monday through Friday all of our machines on the route. Yep. And then I'll handle all the the back end stuff, the paperwork, mm -hmm. the inventory, mm -hmm. the moving machines, responding to service calls. I'll handle all that of that too. kind of stuff. All right. So yeah, they focus mainly on making sure that our customers are happy and everything's good. So that's a full time there is having those guys fill the, do the route. Now, when you got started, what, eight years ago, you mentioned, right. right? What was the biggest challenge you faced? How did you overcome it? What can you advise our viewers in yeah. terms of prep to avoid that mistake? Yeah, and I, I fell for it and a lot of new vendors do. It's, you think every vending machine is the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you think just because a vending machine is a vending machine. And now, especially in this day and age with credit card readers, you know, the old machines that are not compatible, they don't make parts for them anymore. Buying quality machines is the biggest mistake that I see 
people make. A $300 machine is not the same as a $3,000 machine, and there's a reason why. So if well, somebody's just getting started out, I would recommend invest in quality equipment because it's gonna pay you in the long run. So interestingly enough, they're still selling the crap old equipment. Right, right. Is and that a fact? It, it is, I mean, people don't know. I mean, there's not a lot of education out there for people, you can't take a high school course in it, you can't take a college credit, there's no education right. there for the vending business, so people just think, yeah, I'll just pick this one up off Facebook for mm -hmm. 500 bucks and I'll put it in here. Then they You're realize money. it doesn't take a card reader, you can't get a keypad for it, and the board, the parts you can't get. So now you have basically just a piece of scrap. Hmm. So that's unfortunate, and that's why I try to help people, you know, to, to get away from that and to invest in the quality equipment. So tell us how many machines you got in your route right now, roughly how much on average each one makes, and what factors determine whether a machine makes 1,000 or 500? Yeah, so right now we have roughly around 100 machines and average you know, 500 to 1,000 a month in sales. Vending is all about locations mm -hmm. and foot traffic, meaning whether it's customers, employees, or visitors, right? The more people that come across that machine, the higher volume, the higher sales that it's gonna produce and the more money it's gonna make. Location is number one, I'm guessing right. price is number two. Well, there's four keys to vending, location, machines, service, and pricing. You have to nail all four of those in order to be successful. All right, let's talk about a good strategy that a small vending business can pursue to grow their route. What comes to your mind with your experience? Yeah, so for small companies, I mean, outbound sales, like going and talking to potential customers is gonna be your cheapest, uh, most effective way. Mm -hmm. You know, going into locations and finding out if they have vending, if they're not happy, and offering your service, right? Finding out they have a problem and you be the solution. So that's the cheapest way mm -hmm. and, and the most effective way to go about that. Doesn't cost you anything but time. Right? You print up some brochures, right? Have a game plan and drive around and, and, and get started. Do you literally just drive around or do you make phone calls ahead of time? Or can you show up to you know, Safeway and be like, hey, can I talk to the manager? Can it be that simple? You can, you can blindly go in. I mean, we have a whole process and a whole system that we use here. You know, you can go on Google Maps and look at parking lots in your area and see how many, what business is this? Instead of driving blindly, right? Mm -hmm. You can go and see, oh, okay, this is a manufacturing plant here. They have a hundred vehicles here. Right. Let me put that on the list to check out and see. So, you know, before you even get in the car, yeah. you know, you can go around. You can pick up the phone and call, you know, before you go um, that way too. But it is nice person to person, right? Gotcha. To walk up and, and, and talk to them and, and find out if they're happy and, yep. and talk see to you about eyes, your service. See right, your body exactly. language, exactly. see how nice you are, yeah. your beautiful smile. Exactly. It all goes a long way. Yep. Cool. Guys, keep watching. Adam's going to share more about the tactics and the outbound sales that he mentioned. So uh, keep watching. Would you guys like to start your own million dollar vending machine business like Adam did? Well, today you're in luck. Upflip and Adam partnered up to develop a complete blueprint that you can use to start your own seven-figure vending machine business. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so this blueprint, it goes over A to Z, how to get started. Whether you want one machine or a hundred machines, it's gonna show you how to start from zero experience, and it's gonna be broken down into six different modules that are gonna go over the four keys of vending. First is location, how to get profitable locations that are actually gonna make money. Two, the machines how to buy quality machines, which machines to buy. Three, your service. What do you, should you put in the machines? What's the best products to put in the machine? How often should you go to the machine? And then four, pricing. What do you price them all for? In this day and age, what do you need to make the amount of money that you want? So if you want, check out the course. Guys, we at Upflip only choose the very best professionals to bring you the insights into success, and Adam is among the finest. In fact, we believe in the blueprint so much that today we're giving you a free training on how to start a vending machine business. So click the link in the description below and get started. Well, as we're surrounded by the world of snacks here and yeah. drinks and sugar, right? Uh, let's talk about how you purchase all this stuff. Where, what's the best way to source it? Are there relationships you build over time to get the best deals, etc.? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people ask, "Hey, Adam, why do, do you link up with you know Coke or Pepsi directly, for these yeah. distributors?" There is a number of options. I could order directly from you know Coke or uh, Pepsi for product and mm -hmm. get it delivered. But the problem is, it's it's a lot more expensive. So 90% of everything you see here is from Sam's Club. Mm -hmm. Oh, right? wow. So I put the order in online, and then we go pick it up, because there's a Sam's Club less than a mile away from our shop. Mm -hmm. This is why we're strategically located yep. here. Everything's close um, by. So we can get the product in and stock the shelves. The problem when you're ordering through these larger distributors, for example, a can of Sprite at Sam's Club is 50 cents. If I were to order that and have that delivered from Coke or any of these other distributors, it'd be 75 cents. 
Interesting, because okay. you're not so, buying in that bulk that Sam's is. Exactly. Whatever you can get the best price from, at the end of the day, is where you want to order from. What mistakes did you make early on with regards to managing or growing your route, and what did you learn from it, Evan? Yeah, so when I first started, I was trying to do too much. I was doing vending machines. I was doing frozen food machines. I was doing oh, wow. coffee machines. I didn't have an expertise in anything. And once I kind of cut the fat and kind of just focused on, okay, let me get this right. Let me get snack machines and drink machines down before mm -hmm. I try to expand and everything else. That's when really things changed, wow. right? Yeah. Hyper-focused on one thing. You said that's really when things started to right. change for the better. Exactly. For the, for the better. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I see you got all this repair stuff. What's all this? Do you fix everything? Absolutely everything in machines? Yes. Or you... So most of the vending machines, you know, most of the parts are plug and play. For example, like if your coin mech goes bad, mm -hmm. you can turn the machine off, unplug it, get a new one, and install it. Just... We don't really, you know, dive deep into fixing the internals. We just send them off to get repaired. Gotcha. Kind of the same. These are all refrigeration oh, decks wow. for vending machines yep. that need to be have a repair tech take a look at. But. I mean, and you then, still fix some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some if we need to install stuff or drill some holes or, you know, fix some things. But yeah, this is a kind of a nice work area to cool. work out of. So you mentioned that you purchased an existing route. I'm curious, what did you pay for it? And is that was that typical in, in that time to pay for that Mara kid? I paid 120000 Whoa. for it, but 60000 down, and then he owner financed 60000 for the route, which was paid off over three years. The 120 includes the machines, Include, the inventory, right. the contracts, everything. Everything. How did you finance the 120 besides the 60 seller carry? Family, my oh, wow. dad, brother, me, we pulled in money. They believed in the vision and wanted to grow it. And okay. it's turned into a nice family business. For somebody who says, hey, I, I don't have the money to buy an existing right. route, I want to start new. Right. Um, where would you start knowing what you know today? Yeah, I would start talking to your local network, your churches, schools, people you know. Mm -hmm. Talk to them, say, hey, do you guys have vending at your work? You know, where you work, do you have a, a, a vending machine? How's it going? And then you can reach out to you know businesses in your area that are viable vending locations. Start so, with one, yeah. two, three, and so forth. Right. Cool. How do you keep costs low in a vending machine business and overall you know increase your profits and revenue? Yeah, I think it's about as be being as efficient as possible. If it doesn't hit our criteria of you know the amount of people, the amount of foot traffic in our radius of mm -hmm. service area, mm -hmm. you know we don't just drive somewhere to drive somewhere it's got to fit our our system and i think that's what's helped us back to the focus once we focused on this area and we focused on uh, our business and making it efficient it really shows based on i don't think there's anyone in the in the country that's doing the level of sales we're doing out of one box truck in a vending business so if i wanted to buy a route adam mm -hmm. what places do i look to purchase a route is there a website yeah, there's different websites. I mean, Route for Sales. They have those. Okay. Is, is, is a, we're different routes, right? Like Snyder Lance Route, Bread Routes, and then mm -hmm. they have ATM routes, vending routes. But really, you know, a main way to get started for people is to just Google vending companies. Pick up the phone, call them, you know, say, hey, do you have anything you're looking to sell? Any locations that you might want to sell? Mm -hmm. And more times than not, yeah, we have some locations that are too far away. We, we want to sell them off or I'm looking to get out of the business. We might be interested in selling, but Mainly, it's a, there's not a ton of uh, listing places for them, so it's more yeah. of a word of mouth kind of kind of deal. Gotcha. Is it a fact that there's always routes for sale? They're transferring hands. I mean, in real estate, obviously, right? Sales never stop. Yeah. I'm surprised to hear that that's the fact in, in vending machine sales and routes as well. It's not. The volume is definitely not as high, obviously, right. as real estate. So it's just it just depends on your area where you live and mm -hmm. the, the amount of machines in that area and but people are always moving right so if i'm if someone moving from tampa to uh, texas they're going to need to sell their business so there's always opportunity that comes up there adam as we're loading this up talk to our audience about the 30 30 rule i know you touched on it a little bit yeah but how does that benefit your business and how do, do i click this up or yeah what's... so you just push this in right here i'll push this in okay yep. so yeah 30 30 Basically, it's about being as efficient as possible and keeping okay. your drive time as low as possible um, because you want to be you know, near your machines and near your accounts. So You don't want to expand right, your territory you so big that you're driving you right, know, two hours one direction. Up, if something comes up and you have to fix a machine or repair a machine, then you're dealing with a two-hour round trip just to remove a coin jam or something. There are a lot so, of people out there doing the two-hour commutes. I know somebody you know, in this area who drives you know, two hours to do, do a route once a week, Jeez. and it's... Uh, I mean, but everyone can do their own thing, right? right. It's up, everyone has their own uh, way they want to grow their business. It's just for us, that's not the way we want to be. We want to be lean, mean, fighting machine. There so, you go. Yep. That's what 3030 is all about, you guys. All right. 
What's the best setup? What are the best types of machines to get? Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, so someone's just getting started. I mean, I have my favorites, right? It's, it's like Ford, Chevy, right? People have different brands they recommend, but after doing this for this long, you know, your Vendo 21 series drink machines are the Cadillac of vending machines. Right. So okay. that's what I recommend everybody gets. That's the majority of our routes. That's this machine right here. What does it cost? This new, you're looking four to five thousand dollars. Four to five grand. I mean, used, you probably get half for for half of that. The reason why, durability, reliability. It's gonna this machine. Knock on wood, we, we have a lot of them out in the field, mm -hmm. no issues. It's a bulletproof machine that All people right. aren't gonna have to worry about. For snack machines, I like the brand AMS. Again, it's the same thing. Reliability, easy to work on, parts are inexpensive, simple programming. You don't have to worry about all the uh, all the headache that comes with other machines. Mm -hmm. And the setup, talk about the setup. Um, yeah. Three Coke machines or three and two Yeah, the general setup or? that I would recommend for your first location is you need a viable location first, right? If it can only right. take one machine, I don't recommend that. I recommend a full-size drink machine and a snack machine, like this setup here. That's the best duo? Right, just because if you put in a, it's called a combo machine, which has snacks and drinks in it, mm -hmm. in one machine, the amount of uh, product that it holds is so low that it just doesn't, it just doesn't make you enough money to, to go back and service it. Or if it is a good location, it will empty out too fast you and you'll have to be there every right. two days. That's what I thought, so yeah. with a full size setup, you're actually gonna be in a, in a location that's gonna produce sales that's gonna make you happy. All right, well, so we're loading this thing back up in the truck, right? Yeah, we're and, gonna load uh, this up and uh, take to it to the other location. Here. Yeah, sweet. Okay, well, I'm happy to help. You tell me what to do. I don't want to drop this thing. Yeah, it's going to be an expensive bill. It will be. You're good. Is it not going to tip over? Yeah, you should be good there once it's Sweet. off the ground. Okay, just I'll pull let, I'll let you do it. You pull want me to do it? Spin it around. You, you got it. You trust me that trust much, you. Adam? I trust you. All right. Push it up and on. There you go. Then hold on. Yep. Some physical labor definitely involved, huh? There we go. Good deal. So as we're doing this, talk yeah. to us about concept of pyramid. Prospect pyramid, Prospect yeah. Prospect pyramid, yeah. yeah. What is it all about? Basically, it's just a, um, a guide I created to basically help people know at what point is a location viable. Obviously, there's different types of locations. Yep. And there's different uh, levels that they do in sales. Is that something you created, thought of? Or? It is, yeah, but it's based on just industry standards. Okay. Right, so the minimum viable account that I tell people is 50 people, foot traffic. There needs to be 50 for it to be a viable solution. So it's basically um, a criteria, in a, simply put, It's right? a guide, yeah. It's, it's a guide. A, it's yeah. a guide to, to show people if it has 200, uh, there's 200 people there, it should do this amount in sales. If there's 50 people, it should do this amount. What type of machines you're gonna wanna set it up with or mm -hmm. that it's gonna require. So just helps people know going in what they should expect. Yeah, you have a guy. You're not just right. kind of winging it every time you find Ex a location that exactly. you think is gonna do yep. well. What should a new business that's just starting out in terms of levels, what should they focus on? What's the sweet spot? Yeah, I'd say around uh, any place with about 100 in foot traffic, You know, whether that's employees or customers. Because the problem is if you get something super big, you're not gonna be able to service it. And you're gonna bite off more than you can chew. Gotcha. So, you know, something with the 50 to 100, uh, 100 people traffic. around foot traffic, yep. uh, that would be a nice start. Put your sweet marriage there with the Coke right. and, the, and the chips, and yep. then you should be set. There you go. All right, Blitz time with Adam. Let's dive into it, Adam. You have like 10, 20 seconds to answer these wonderful questions submitted by our audience and subscribers, so thank you guys for taking your time. Alfonso is asking, how can I bid on a property that already has vending machines? What is a good strategy to approach a building manager and offer them machines? Right, so really it's communicating with them and asking them what is their current issue. At the end of the day, if a location has machines and they're doing great service and they're happy, it's not. It's gonna be hard to get them to switch. So yep. your whole goal is when you're talking to this manager in this situation is find out where they're lacking and then mm -hmm. use that as your entry and yep. your solutions. Alfonso, thanks for submitting your question. Marco is wondering, what do, the con what do the conversations sound like when talking with an owner or property manager about making an agreement for a location? Give us a quick script. Yeah, basically I tell them if, the, if you want a contract, we'll do one week, one month, one year. It doesn't matter, we're not gonna lock you in. We stand by our service. If you're not happy, we'll remove our machines. We like want that. you to be happy, and if you're not, we haven't had it happen before, but we'll pull our machines out. Puts them forward, right. puts them you're, above if everything. If they're in complete control. Yep. 
I love that. Okay. Joe, thank you for submitting your question. Is asking, how do I get machines put in malls and government offices, railway stations, etc.? Do larger, or larger organizations require you to be well connected or do they work with sole traders? Is insurance possible? And so on. So it's a case by case basis, but when you start talking about maybe national contracts or national companies, they do typically have, you know, contracts in place, but it doesn't hurt. You have to start the conversation yeah, somewhere and they out. may want to use local uh, providers. You know, a lot of big companies want don't want to use big companies as their their vendors. They want the small local feel. So the Stop. only way to do it is is to ask. The key is start the conversation. Right. Right. Perfect. Okay. And then uh, Sullivan, thank you for submitting your question. This was the last one. What are the risk and loss of money in this business? Is this business manageable remotely, or do you have to be around all the time? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't advertise that you're doing vending as far as flashing the cash and doing all that. As far as risk as an investment, I mean, the only investment you have is your machines up front. So if you buy quality machines, you'll be able to resell them and get your money back. Gotcha. You know, if you're not happy. But yeah, no, I I haven't known a ton of people that have had uh, risky, like getting robbed or anything like that. That's what okay. we're talking. Yeah. yeah. Adam, tell us where we are. I'm really curious because it's a huge, massive building. Yeah. And most importantly, like, how did you secure this contract or this uh, account? Yeah, we're at one of our um, school accounts, the training facility. But the way we got this is, I actually met the director in Sam's Club. Oh wow! Really? Uh, he was around shopping for an event they were having, and I saw the logo that he was wearing. And you were paying attention. Yeah, paying attention. Yeah. Went and asked him, hey. Uh, you know, you guys have any trouble with your vending? Long story short, they were, and set up a meeting and were able to take over. Tell us about common mistakes that you make when you're prospecting for new locations. What's obvious? Yeah, the, the, the sales cycle, people need to understand, is a little bit longer, right? You have to follow up, right? It's not just gonna be a one-time meet and greet, boom, they're done, they're happy. You need to follow up with the location or with the contact and make sure you're, you're front of mind and top of mind. So. so the key boils down to just follow up. Right, follow up, continue to offer value and, and be on their mind that you're gonna solve their issues that they're having. Specifically on the follow up, let's say you, you visited the director here or a new location, mm -hmm. a new prospecting location, and you didn't secure the deal at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. What follow-up in place do you have to then follow up, either via email, text? Is it yeah. a software system or is it just, no, again, go back to old school? Old school, you just want to, when you contacted them and then every couple of weeks you want to follow up until they tell you not to follow up mm -hmm. or email, phone call, try different variations of follow up. All right, guys, make sure you follow up. That's where the key to success is. Let's say I found a great opportunity for a vending route. I don't have cash in hand, but I really want to acquire it. What are my first steps? What are my options? Yeah, what I would say is, uh, you know, you can always ask friends and family for, for money, go to the bank to try to get a loan. You can ask the seller of the route if they'll do owner financing, you know, That's hold some one. of the note so that you can stretch out the terms. If you really want it, you, you'll you'll talk to some people and find, find just, a way. I just want to encourage our viewers that, you know, no money does not mean you can't pursue a business opportunity, business idea, right? right? Would you agree a lot of people limit themselves? Right. Because, yeah. oh, I have no money, therefore I can't do anything. No, no, no. Yeah, creative financing yeah. Is, is definitely a way, especially with vending, to get into it. I didn't know that. I mean, being in real estate, I always thought creative finance is just there, but yeah. today you've educated me <laughs> that, hey, it's even available in buying vending rights. Right, exactly. Owner financing, for sure. What kind of terms, though, uh, since we're on that note? I mean, you could do, it's it's obviously it, dependent on the, uh, on the seller, what they want to accept, maybe a 12-month note of the remaining balance mm -hmm. um, at 10%. You know, who knows what the interest rates are at the time, what, what they're gonna want. Gotcha. But then you're gonna collateralize that with the with the machines and the locations so that if you don't pay, they're gonna gotcha. take so back over. Sounds like everything is negotiable. Right. Whatever you and that seller right. agree on is up, up for grabs. They may have a medical health issue. They can't physically do the, do the route. Mm -hmm. So they need someone to do it. So they'll be more favorable terms. It just depends on case by case, kind of what you can negotiate, right? Gotcha. Let's talk about your pricing strategy. Right. Uh, how do you determine that? How did you work that? What, what's a good advice for our viewers as well? Yeah, so we're in front of a, what's called a five wide. It actually means there's five selections across here at the top. Um, we, the way we set it up, I mean, people can set it up however they want. Instead of having things just mix matched all over the place, mm -hmm. like we start with these are larger bag chips, um, dollar. you know, at a dollar, right? That whatever price point you pick. And then we do smaller bag chips at their price point. Cookie row, we have a chocolate, uh, row, yeah. non-chocolate row, mm -hmm. and then at the bottom you have you know, your pastries and honey buns. So that's a, kind of a general playbook. That way, if you're shopping at Sam's Club or wherever and Cheetos are out of stock, you can substitute that for another item that's similar in the same cost structure, mm -hmm. but put it at, you know where it goes. And especially when you talk about drivers or having people help you, you don't want to have 
things mixed up all, all over, over the place. place. Yeah, but how did you turn, determine a, a buck is what this should be versus a buck 25 or 70? Yeah, and you play with that at different locations. Like okay. a location like this, the volume's high. Mm -hmm. Right at another location, we may charge a dollar fifty. It just depends, you know, per location. But I mean, the general markup is you at least need to double your price of whatever, whatever your charge. So if you buy a can for fifty cents, the you minimum. need to get a minimum at a dollar, and then you could set the price for three dollars for a can, but no one's going to buy it. You have to find the happy medium to where you can generate and Sometimes volume. it takes a little bit of time right. to figure out per location. Exactly. Got well, it. It, it's like here in Florida, there's a number of resorts on the beach, mm -hmm. right? Or when people go on vacation at a resort, they'll pay $2 for a can. Right. Whereas if you're in a, a workplace or a blue collar environment, they don't want to get gouged like that. So yep. knowing your audience. Yep, know your audience. Well said. All right, sales kit, you have one. Yeah. Tell our audience what's in it, what's important to have in there, what's not important to overwhelm the client. Yeah, basically you wanna have a sample contract, a proposal, you wanna have your agreement or whatever you want, marketing brochures, a list of the machines that you carry, maybe some product that you would put in the machines. Mm -hmm. um, it's always better with sales to show, don't tell. Show them the right. a picture of the machine, don't just tell them we're gonna put a vending machine in. Mm -hmm. So just the those key elements, yeah, to make sure that you're prepared. All right, let's talk about the brands of machines that are uh, most favorable, proven, right. where to buy them, get the best price, and so forth. I mean, okay. we're, we're surrounded by all of your machines besides yeah. the ATM, right? Yeah. So these are Vendo, uh, Vendo 721 machines. They're 10 selections, right? They hold a bunch of product. I mean, over here, these are AMS machines. Same thing, these are refrigerated. They can do uh, food items or they can do drinks, everything like that. So as far as where to get them, these are all sold through distributors. You might go through a distributor if you're in California that has a distributorship in mm -hmm. your area. Just, just you can find do, who right, distributes Just them? go on their websites and you can look up where in your area is the closest distributor. What do companies want from a vending machine company and how do you provide that at Hill Vending? Right, so- What 90, is it boiled down to? Yeah, 90% of the, the, the accounts that call us, they already have vending. They already have vending. Interesting. There's not gold mines out there where people don't have machine. If they need it, they'll just call someone and get machines. But the reason that they call or that we transfer into those locations is service. Service is the number one lacking trait of wow. the majority of vending businesses. You know, there's a lot of mom and pop operations or there's a lot of smaller vendors that they're doing it on the side and yeah. it, you know, it can fall by the wayside and the machines are empty and the employees or customers are not, you know, not being able to use the machines. So at the end of the day, that's the glaring deficiency in the vending business is the lack of service that people provide. Do you feel like there's a gap in this industry with regards to the, the poor service, right? Like, is there a missing software or a missing technique or, or something? I'm just thinking out of the blue. Like, yeah. if there's a lot of people out there that are calling you and saying, hey, we need you to come in because our guy, what is it? Is it because there's a lot of small mom and pop operations that are kind of screwing it up for the ones that are doing it the best? Yeah, well, even, even the small mom and pop, but even the larger companies. Don't want to name any names, but yeah. some big, large national companies. Doesn't make them. That's who we, we get a lot of, of accounts from. <laughs> maybe they're too spread thin. Maybe they're just focusing on their large, massive accounts and letting the other stuff fall by the wayside. But hmm. It's like in any other business, right? Right, right. exactly. Got Things it. get in the way and then people don't, yeah, people just want their machines to be full and, and taken care of. Sweet. Credit card readers, let's talk yeah. about them. Do all of your machines have them? Pretty Not much? all of them, but most of them, yeah. Would you say that that's where things are headed? Like, that I they, would say in five years, all of our machines should be. will have card readers, yes. I mean, I've even seen machines where they're going no cat, just card only. Oh, wow. So, Talk to us about the setup, the cost to you. Um, yeah, so this brand is called uh, Cantaloupe, is the provider of this. They run roughly $300 to buy the device. So the machine um, isn't doesn't come with it? This does not come with it, right. Then they run off cell service, okay. which is uh, $10 a month. Whether this machine does one transaction or 200 transactions, you gotta pay that fee for it to be connected to the internet. So you're spending 60 bucks a month here. Right. Because you have six machines here. Exactly, per device. This is a newer vending machine. This is a, a, a Wittern, Wittern brand machine, but that has the iVend, which basically means that it guarantees the delivery of the product, mm -hmm. right? There's a laser beam oh, yeah, down there that, that guarantees that the product drops. So these are what, what you get when you buy newer machines. You get you know a little more technology. It's card capable. I mean, this is handicap accessible area yeah. location. Yeah, just so. like everything. In terms of servicing your machines, talk to us about how you do that. Is there a system, a tool that you use that pops up and says, hey, something's broken there? Or how does that work in your world? How we do it is we have our locations set on a service schedule. You can run a report and it'll tell you you need four body armor, five Arizona, this, that. Mm -hmm. You pre-kit here in the warehouse, then go to the location. Gotcha. The way we do it is a rolling inventory on our box truck. Mm -hmm. So some locations maybe twice a week, some three times a week. 
some once a week, every two weeks. It just mm -hmm. depends based on the volume. So you mean you go there whether it's broken or not, but that service schedule is gonna tell you, hey, go visit, make sure everything's good. Normally, if there is something wrong, we have a contact person at the location gotcha. that so will let us know. Gotcha, so they call you right away? Right. Anything that has a credit card reader on it, got you it. can dial in, it runs off cell service, and you can uh, get a live look nice. at it. Yep. Okay. Here's what I'm curious about too, like how do you make the selections for each machine? Like how do you know to put Milano's and Lay's versus other products. There's so much out there that you can put in there. Right, after having so many machines out and seeing what sells, you kind of know what sells based on what's moving mm -hmm. through the machines. So if we come back and Lay's salt and vinegar haven't moved, right? Yeah. Then we know that that's not a that's not a good seller. We'll switch that out. And it's different so. per location. I'm guessing there's no playbook that you open up and say, well, there is. here, here's what sells more. Well, there, is. there Yeah, like so for example, like on a drink machine, Coke and say Mountain Dew are in every drink machine mm -hmm. because those are the one and two sellers. So we already figured that out. You yeah, know, that's like no brainer. water, water's in bottled water in machines. Mm -hmm. So, but then when you get the, down to the like rest. the last selections, you may put in ginger ale in one machine and maybe tea in another. It just depends. But you have your core staple kind of items, yeah, mm. for both machines. Okay. Drink and snack. What last couple pieces of advice can you give them yeah. as we conclude? I mean, my main goal is for whatever advice I give anybody is mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I don't want you to lose money. You're gonna invest money in machines and equipment and I want you to buy quality machines so that if you find out in a couple months vending's not for you, mm -hmm. you can sell your equipment and you're not gonna get bottom barrel pennies on the dollar for your equipment. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you're investing thousands of dollars into equipment. I want you to be able to recoup that if you change your mind. Okay, awesome. Make sure you guys check out the link in the description below for the course. It doesn't hurt, one hour free to get you going. And Adam, this has been a pleasure. Awesome, thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks. Well, there you have it, guys. This is a wrap with Adam Hill, the owner of Hill Vending. Thank you so much for watching. I trust you enjoyed it. The goal for you is to execute on everything you've learned and succeed. Thank you again for watching. Make sure you check out our other videos that we've done with other industries. And take a second to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so that you don't miss any of our videos. Thank you so much.